That's it, that's it, it's the uh, How rare is this one? Is it very rare? Yes, that one is very rare. Uh, I understand that there's only one really mint condition which is in the Toy Museum uh, in London. In London. Yes. Uh, and you can get these from time to time, but very, very rare in good condition. Yes. This is the best I've ever seen. That's because of its great age, of course. I think toy trains uh, they are the hardware the, the, the icons almost of, of their youth railways were to the children growing up in the 1920s and 30s the way airliners were to the generation of the 60s and 70s uh, they were the new technology or computers today and um, as they evolved during the early 1930s into streamlined trains, which was the great thing at that time. Of course, um, they were very exciting. And a, and a new locomotive, can you imagine, would, would there be a photograph on the front page of the national newspaper. I think in the future, they'll be collected as objects, which are very direct uh, reminders of, of a particular period. And the 1920s and 1930s, are certainly going to be remembered as a very remarkable period and the objects associated with that. Craig Hornby worked as a clerk in a meatpacking company in Liverpool and then uh, he had this idea and he invented Meccano, uh, basically the toy for his children. And from that, in the turn of the century, grew Meccano Limited. And of course, Hornby trains um, followed on after the First World War. His first uh, notion was to build a, a Meccano type train, uh, which would have been quite unique, that you could build up and take apart and where you could Meccano. And then obviously, um, as the railways became the great thing of the interwar years, he realized that people wanted regional railways in green and red or whatever colors the railways were to look like the real things, because people, railway travel was becoming very, very popular and very widespread. So he had to build models that, that, to respond to this demand for a sort of reality, a sort of scale appearance. Yes, I think that's a, a nice station of its time. I particularly like the name, of course, John. Windsor, very yes. patriotic. And of course, the royal family changed its name to Windsor in 1917. Right. And for that reason, because they were a German based family. Yeah. Yes. And Hornby was able to come in by 1920 introducing the trains that exactly. everybody wanted to buy yes. British. Yes, although uh, DRGM, dirty rotten German make, uh, <laughs> was prevalent at that time, I think that Frank Hornby would have pre been preeminent anyway, because the quality of the stuff that he produced was far ahead of that of the Germans. What I do think is that it would not have taken off as quickly as it did, or as well as it did, and the range grow as quickly as it did, had it not been for the anti-German feeling. I think it would have been a harder climb upwards, whereas it was a, it was immediate um, success with the first trains that came Absolutely. out. Absolutely, and of course, on all the publicity, and including the boxes, the legend British and Guaranteed appeared. Yes. yes. Um, very important for the... Very important for the times. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, reflects the social history of the thing. Yes. Very effectively. Well, up to the First World War, toy trains, model trains in this country had almost exclusively been made in, in Germany. Um, they weren't always labelled as such. But of course, after the obvious emotional uh, traumas of the First World War, it was quite difficult to um, sell German goods in the early 1920s. So Hornby trains, I think, I think captured the essence. They were... English in the sense that they were um, not too technical, but they had that, that sort of sense of uh, majesty and pomp. Hornby, like most other train manufacturers in the 20s and 30s and before, kept as up to date as they possibly could with every development that was going on. And so if cars changed, then the pictures of the cars had to change. If fashions changed, then the figures changed. Um, in order to um, make the differences in the, in the fashion of the day, and so on. That machine there that, that makes oh, the letters. Oh, the name-making machine. Oh, I, I remember them. You just put a penny in and get ten letters. You just That's put a big right. handle in. And a slip of aluminium came out with That's your right. name on. Or your sweetheart's I name, think, whichever it is. I think your aluminium was zinc, actually.
One of the things which was very characteristic of the real stations in the old days was that everyone had its own coal yard. And the wagons used to bring the coal in and the lorries used to take it away. And it was a well-known sight to see shoveling of coal. Now, of course, you can do this with a Hornby train because you've got imitation coal and you've got little lorries and you've got wagons to put it in. The reason they're there, though, isn't it, John? Because they were a part of station furniture. They were a part of station Whenever you went on a station, particularly in the country, there'd be a trolley with there some would. milk churns or some milk churn stoves because the milk waiting for the milk train to pass. Later on, and this is reflected again in Hornby series, um, the glass line milk tank came into being, which virtually saw the end of, of milk churns on stations because it was bulk, um, bulk tanking. Um, hiking was, till the early 30s, as aerobics is to present day, except that it was much more uh, healthy because it was done out of doors and aerobics was done indoors. But yes, it, 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 it's the keep fit theme. Child, is it? I mean, she's very, uh, she's very, very well dressed. She's the, she's dressed in the height of early thirties fashion. That lady. Yeah. And there is another lady in the passenger series, right, Jim, yeah. in a maroon coat with a, a dark brown or black fur collar and a little pillbox hat. Now. I have a photograph of my mother, and she is dressed exactly the same as yeah, that, yeah. And, and the coat was exactly the same colour as well, which is very strange. All I can remember is that when I smell the smoke, of a train now, as you do on the North Yorkshire North Railway. It reminds me of the 1930s and going on a holiday, that smell of smoke that used to creep into the carriages, even though the windows were shut. It always reminds me of going on holiday in the 1930s. It was an exciting sort of smell, the smoke, and the clatter over the points. You, you ended up a little bit dirty sometimes. Well, I remember the waiting rooms, lovely waiting rooms. There were ladies and gents already separate. And they were always very hot. I remember them being very hot. They had a big black porcelain stove with a pipe up from the top. Sometimes they got red hot. And uh, they were a bit dangerous, really. But it was lovely if you went in on a cold day to wait for a train in comfort by the side of this lovely warm stove. Yes, I do remember that very clearly. They were lovely. I was enthralled by the model Pullman coaches, but I had never ridden in an actual Pullman coach until I was 12 years old, when my parents took me on holiday to Brighton. We travelled in a genuine, real Pullman coach from Victoria to Brighton on the Brighton Bell, and that was a thrill I shall never forget. That, that's the three penny one, yes. Three new penny ones. That would cost three new pennies. Three new pennies. Right at the other end of the scale. Right at the other end of the scale. Very beautiful. Oh, absolutely. All hand-finished look. Yes, hand lined, hand finished, hand door. transferred, even the doors open. Lovely coach that. Neither of them, of course, for scale. Oh, hopeless. Hopeless. Both, both running on the I same mean, track. the same gauge, but not the same scale. That's right, yeah. And there's a lesson in scale for you. And then in, and the, between. Uh, in between, yeah. And then yeah. there'll be another. That's right, yeah. 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 The man's wages was roughly about a pound a week. 150 in the labouring community. So of course it wasn't possible to bring a family up and buy toys of that sort of size. When I was a kid, in the village I was brought up in, it was only the better off children that have these. I didn't have them, and I always said that I would get them, and by God I have. Haven't we? My set reflects the 20s and 30s, absolutely. There's 
nothing on it uh, that was manufactured after the war. And this is important to me because that is my era. Oh, I think there are also reasons for adults wanting trains. Uh, sometimes it's because they weren't allowed to have them when they were children. I think, too, there's a, a desire on the part of people who have a large setup to be in control of an entity and, and to say, I, I, my hand's on the controller, I can make these trains go anywhere I want, I can put the signals up and down, the lights on and off and so forth, and you control a little world of your own. Well, parents were funny in those days. They seemed to think that you ought to give up toys when you were about 15. And I wanted to carry on with trains. My father kept on at me. You ought to go in for more manly things, like sport. Well, of course, when the war came, I, I was called up fairly soon. And so uh, things like that were put away. And I, mine were eventually sold. I think the reason why people collect these things nowadays is because they do reflect the past. And there's a considerable amount of nostalgia about. I'm not sure that nostalgia on its own is a good thing. But when it is combined with a love of a product which has been beautifully made uh, and made to last, that is a different matter. The items stand up in their own right uh, as little works of art. Inside track screen, we can use that. One of the things Frank Hornby was well ahead of his time about was advertising. He was a first-rate marketing man. The, the idea of the slogan, British and Guaranteed, and other slogans, um, made people be loyal to that brand. Also, he had dotted about his series wagons with advertisements on for things like biscuits and petrol and Coleman's mustard. And he also produced little advertisements to stick on station platforms that were just like the ones that you saw as you went around. Hand finishing was something that the Hornby Company prided itself in. On the locomotives, the lining and the transfers were hand applied, and the operative always signed her signature underneath initials, that is. And we think that that was a form of quality control. All the operatives there, apart from the foreman, really, were mostly women, all working in the Bins Road factory in Liverpool uh, on manufacturing Hornby trains. I get a lot of correspondence from Australia and Canada, and they say, John, look, we can't get these trains over here. Um, uh, send some over for us, you know. I won't do it. You know, keep them here. I take a little bit of old gauge, you know, but just the ones that are duplicated over here. But um, we're not going to let them have them, you know. We have a job to find them ourselves. Certainly, when it came to 38 and 39, there were signs in, in the Hornby world that, that things were changing, and some of the more the brightly coloured things disappeared. It may have been because it reflected the, the um, ominous coming of the war. The war, of course, ended the whole production of, of, of toy trains, 
and there were no materials. Um, I think they went on maintenance about 1940, but there were just no more materials left, and Hornby went over to war work. And um, that was the end of an era, and they never came again. And um, during that period, of course, they, um, they, reached their, they reached their zenith. In the 1950s, it just, it just gradually dwindled to a few sets uh, that, that were offered in toy shops, not model shops. And then uh, Hornby had all sorts of, uh, Hornby had to invest very heavily in its double O range. And it got caught rather badly commercially because it had a three rail system. And then it had to retool for a two rail system. So effectively, they died in 1939. Uh, I did visit the place in the 70s when it was still in full production. It was quite a stressful, noisy place and there's buzzing with activity. Um, people showing cotlers and Meccano and around and could have belts full of toys. That was fine, but then they came on the closure that they suddenly one Friday afternoon went around to all his employees and said, we're ceasing production, you're all redundant, as from four o'clock today. Ironically enough, over Christmas. And after Christmas, I uh, had the opportunity of going into the factory and it was just damp and, and still. And it was very slightly Marie Celeste. Um, cups of coffee, half drunk. It was just as if those people had just disappeared out of the place and it was so sad. It was just, as I say, like the Marie Celeste, everything just evaporated. Our next film takes us back to a more...